The 2022 Met Gala was a few weeks ago, and I know, I'm pretty late to the party. But that's because I didn't intend to make a gown for this year's theme, which was Gilded Age Glamour. Honestly, I'm not super involved in modern fashion, although I do see some of the trends here and there because I have friends who explore that side of things. Since the grape gown is an early 1890s dress, sitting somewhere between 89 and 92, it fit the theme, though, quite literally. I made this gown for an annual Victorian ball, which happened to fall two days before the Met Gala. Many people in the fashion community, including the more niche historical fashion community, have spoken about feeling mostly disappointed with the execution of this year's theme. Honestly, I wanted to see someone show up wearing full historical Golden Age garb, but I guess that would be wishful thinking. So not only will I be showing you how I made the rest of the grape gown, including the bodice and coordinating accessories, I'm also going to be living out my fictitious Met Gala fantasy where someone actually shows up wearing historical clothing. In the last episode of the series, I showed you how I hand sewed the ball gown skirt and detachable train. So this being the final installment, I'll be going through the process of everything else. As with all the other things I make for myself on this channel, this ensemble is 100% hand-stitched, and normally I give an estimate of the time it took to make the gown, but I only had a month to hand sew and film everything because I bought a last-minute ticket to the ball, so I didn't really count my hours particularly thoroughly. I'm just going to give a rough estimate and say that the entire ensemble took me around 200 to 250 hours to make. And that's mostly due to an excessive amount of accessories, which I kept deciding to sew in order to avoid working on the bodice. If you do the math outside of my 60 hour work weeks and actually having to sleep, I didn't have much of a life besides sewing for most of a month, but I at least knew it was temporary. Since the grape gown fits right into the Gilded Age, I thought I'd briefly explain what this term even means. It describes a period of rapid economic growth in the United States extending from around 1870 to 1900. It's full of some rather charming ensembles and plenty of inspiration for a Met Gala, so I'm a bit perplexed as to why the theme wasn't pursued in greater depth, but that's beside the point. My sewing project, whilst certainly qualifying as Gilded Age because it's 1890s, is in the theme of Italian Renaissance Revival, which you see quite a bit in the late 1800s. I absolutely love revival movements because they let you try new techniques you may not have had the opportunity to before, especially if you get stuck sewing in certain centuries. Before I begin working on an ensemble, I like to place all the materials out together to see how I feel about the colors and make adjustments as needed. So that's what I did this time to try and get inspired. Right away, I did not like the shade of the lime green linen. I felt it was far too bright and didn't have the same undertone as the other colors. I wasn't positive if the solution I had in mind would work, but I decided to give it a go anyways. That solution was to tea dye the green linen to give it a slightly more brown undertone, which would help it match the other materials better. At least that's what I thought in my head. So I soaked about a million black tea bags into my giant canning pot and dyed the linen. It worked so incredibly well, actually, and the shade I got was exactly what I wanted. I won't go into extreme depth here about the tea dyeing process, as I've actually filmed a separate video on this topic, which I'm going to release hopefully next month. After I was happy with the state of my materials, I started on the hat before all else. Essentially, I wanted to be the female embodiment of William Shakespeare. So that was the general vibe I was going for, and this hat really did it for me. It's a style known as a soft hat, and you do see them a bit in the 1890s, though definitely not as often as the boater. The guide for how to make this one is from the Victorian Dressmaker's Companion by Prior Attire. It was actually quite simple to construct and required mainly a four-layer system where I cut circles of a linen lining, leftover silk interfacing from the berry dress fabric actually, and then a layer of cotton batting. And finally, I cut long strips of the purple cotton velvet for the outer fabric, which matches the bodice and the skirt. From here, it was a lot of gathering, many meters worth in fact, a lot of stitching the velvet to the three layer base, and having to manipulate the velvet by pinning it down at the gathers to create circular masses, one tier on top of the other, ending with a scrap stuffed pom-pom at the top. In the end, I was left with this wonderfully floppy and renaissance feeling hat. And best of all, the pom-pom doubles as a pincushion. How convenient. 
No hat is complete without a bit of decoration, so I added this 1930s vintage brooch with green and purple stones, and then a couple of curled green feathers. From here I moved on to the undersleeves. This 1890 Renaissance inspired gown from the Met was my main inspiration, but I had to improvise my own pattern and I had no idea if it was going to work. Last year I Frankensteined a pair of 1880s bathing suit short sleeves with Regency long sleeves to create long bathing suit sleeves, and it worked very well. I decided I'd use the same combined pattern, but then slash it up to essentially widen the pattern by at least three times. Then I'd create rows of gathering stitches all up and down the sleeve and secure them, creating the bunched up gathered effect that you see in the extant. So I did quite a bit of drafting and even more gathering and plenty of flat felling, until I had a pair of lovely undersleeves and I was very happy with them. I'll show you how I ended up securing them into the bodice towards the end of this video. I went ahead and also devised how to make the main bodice sleeves from the velvet since they would have the same slits in them. I used the same bathing suit short sleeve pattern, but instead of making it wider, I lengthened it to elbow's length and decided where I wanted the opening to be and bravely cut the fabric there. Then I marked where the rows of olive braid would go to create that joined effect, and I tried to match up their placement as closely as I could with the gathering lines of the undersleeves. I stitched down each of the braid pieces, and once everything was in place, I proceeded to finish any raw seams using a matching purple tool tape so that it could camouflage easily. Now that the sleeves were mostly done, it was on to the rest of the bodice. I decided to cut the lining of the bodice out of the lime green linen, but I used the version before I tea dyed it as I had some left over. For the pattern, I made about three mock-ups and finally settled on this one. I used the base of the 1890 walking suit pattern I made last year, which comes from Patterns of Fashion 2, but I modified it heavily by doing things like taking away any parts hanging below the waistline and also tightening all the back seams to give the bodice a more fitted look. Even though you don't see high-necked evening bodices as often during this period, they did exist, and so I wanted to create this style, hence why I used a walking suit shape as the base for my evening gown. I also cut all the pieces out from the cotton velvet and marked all the seam lines with Taylor's tacks. Then I placed all the linen pieces onto the cotton velvet pieces and flatlined them, henceforth treating them as one. I carefully basted the correlating pieces together so that way I'd be able to try on the bodice and decide how much space to remove from the back seams, and in general just to get a better fit. Now it was time for a first fitting. You can see here how much excess space I needed to remove from the back seams. This space exists because the original walking suit had tabs that hung down, so it wasn't a completely fitted garment at the lower back. Because of this, I evenly took some space out of each seam to bring it in, but it took about six different fittings to get the bodice to a point where I was happy with it. I also took a bit of space out of the shoulder seams to remove some excess room from the bust, and this adjustment seemed to help a lot. Once I was satisfied with the fit, I stitched all of the seams up carefully using tiny back stitches. I also notched all the seams to help release some tension and produce a smoother fit. For the collar of the bodice, I cut out a layer of horsehair canvas for interlining, which I pad stitched very haphazardly onto the other fabric, and I ended up lining it with some of the lime green silk in order to match the detachable train. The raw edges where I stitched the collar on, I covered them with some purple twill tape and whip stitches, and the bottom edges of the bodice I also bound with silk tape as well as the center front openings and really any other seams that I could think to finish. For the event, I didn't manage to finish any of the inside seams, however, and I also didn't manage to create any tie tapes for the undersleeves as I intended to make them detachable. So in proper ball fashion, a friend helped me pin the sleeves in, because no ball would be complete without a million safety pins. I did, however, manage to complete all of the antique hooks and eyes, and so this meant at least my bodice could stay shut and I didn't need to be sewn into it. Once I got home from the ball, I worked on the final touches like finishing most of the raw seams with whip stitches. I still have a couple of seams left if I'm being honest, but I'll get to them eventually. And then I also made a stay tape to sit at the waist, which is just going to help keep the bodice in place and give the weight of the skirt an area to anchor onto. You see stay tapes often used in very well-made historical extants from the Victorian period. I attached the stay tape using small X stitches, making sure not to get any onto the right side of the garment. 
And before the ball, I bound the sleeve heads of the undersleeves with some bias tape so that I could later attach the ties to be able to tie them on and tie them off. I did this to perhaps one day switch them out with another set if need be. So after the ball, I marked where to place the ties on both the undersleeves and the bodice. I bound the arms eyes of the bodice with twill tape and I attached the ties. The final step was sewing on a few hooks and eyes at the waist of the bodice and the waist of the skirt, so that way the weight of the skirt doesn't pull down and it is instead held up by the bodice. I also made a matching tea-dyed green linen jabot to go underneath the bodice and I figure I can wear it as well over shirtwaists in the future so it won't exclusively have to be for this ensemble. I also sewed a matching reticule which is a little purse and I used a sweet antique grape berry kind of motif and some silk grape leaf decorations to add an extra little touch. The final accessory I put together is the capelet and this one in particular I used to procrastinate working on the bodice mostly. I ended up going quite overboard with the braid and so most of making it consisted of doing this and this and more of this. Four days on end. I freehand drew this design directly onto the fabric and tailors tacked it so that the design would be transferred symmetrically onto both sections. The spiral tendrils of grape plants is what inspired this design for me and also some of the extravagant braiding that you see on military jackets of the period. I used an antique collar in my collection as the base for it and made some modifications accordingly. It's essentially a circle, so aside from being time consuming, the construction itself was not difficult. For my hair, I styled it with long curls in the front to mimic spiral grape tendrils again. I paired up the ensemble with this antique Victorian grape brooch, which I felt was just perfect for the theme. And it also fits the time period, which is convenient. And the final touch was long brown leather gloves, which match my brown wool stockings. I felt that the brown represented the soil of the earth very well. I hope you've enjoyed watching the grape gown come to fruition, no pun intended. What I'm even more excited about is the reveal that you're about to see. I put a lot of thought into making it, so thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all in two weeks for another video. Mm -hmm.